Very good morning to all of you and uh, welcome to this press conference with the co-chairs of the World Economic Forum on ASEAN 2018, uh, which this year is being held under the theme ASEAN 4.0, Entrepreneurship and the Fourth Industrial Revolution. The purpose of this press conference is to give you an opportunity to hear firsthand from our six co-chairs um, about some of the priorities that they are looking to feature um, and highlight in this, uh, in this uh, meeting. We choose our co-chairs every year. Um, we look for um, high-profile individuals with a really strong passion about Southeast Asia, um, the challenges and the issues that the region is facing, um, and a strong commitment to raising awareness around these issues and trying to stimulate positive action in addressing and making a difference on these priorities. So uh, I'm going to give each of them in turn an opportunity to share with you um, some of the priorities that they feel very strongly about in the ASEAN region um, and also to share what they hope uh, this summit can, make, can do to make a contribution in addressing those challenges. We don't have very long, so they won't have um, uh, very much time to share their thoughts, um, but we will leave a little bit of uh, time at the end for uh, you to ask uh, questions um, of them. I'm going to go uh, in alphabetical order. Um, so let me start um, with Anne Birgit Albrechtson uh, in the middle. Anne works for an organization focused on social inclusion, gender equality, children and youth. It's called Plan International, and Anne is the CEO. Anne. Thank you very much, Justin, and, and thanks to everybody. So Plan International is obviously delighted to be given this opportunity and platform um, to come here to the ASEAN region and shine a light on social inclusion with business leaders and political leaders um, in the region. Um, the th theme of, the, um, of, of, of this particular forum resonates well with our constituency, young female entrepreneurs. Young female entrepreneurs in parts of ASEAN that don't necessarily um, see the day of light um, here. We, we work with young migrant women that uh, um, are given skills and opportunities to go into enterprise. Um, and we really want to, uh, to talk with, with participants here about the lack of financing for young female entrepreneurs. Um, another theme here, of course, is the digital economy. What we're seeing with the digital economy and as it grows is that the great strides that the ASEAN countries have made in closing the gender gap is actually widening again. Um, we are seeing that women have less access to the internet, less access to mobile phones. Uh, young girls and women have less skills to enter the technology sector. Generally in technology, we are seeing only 10% of the employees are young women. And they're certainly not driving up the ladder in companies. We are seeing only a third of corporate leadership um, across the ASEAN region are women. So there are lots of gender gaps that we will help shine a light on. Finally, um, we'll also be looking at issues of what are the underlying structural issues that are making this happen. It really is about social norms. It's about the fact that women are still expected to take care of the home. Um, and young women today simply can't see themselves in tech in industry, in, 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 uh, in banking, in higher positions. So let me finish by saying that fundamentally we need a new paradigm for leadership in ASEAN. Um, young girls and women um, cannot be what they cannot see. Um, so we need to give them better role models and who better than the two women that um, I have on the panel with me uh, from Korea and, and Indonesia. Thank you. And thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Minister um, Wen Man Hong, who is the Acting Minister for uh, Information and Communications Technologies here in Vietnam. Minister. Okay, thank you, Rastin, and um, good morning. Uh, the topic this time, the Forum on ASEAN, uh, very interesting, uh, the technology management, the digital ASEAN, the force, the industrial revolution, and the startups business. I think that is a good chance for all of us to share the stories, the case study, 
experience, and especially the new ideas, new initiatives for Asia. Um, I'm coming to this um, event with some the, um, uh, initiative ideas for One Asia. The first one is to make ASEAN flat. We call it flat ASEAN with no roaming. The roaming charge as low as the local charge. So that the, uh, every people can travel the, uh, like home. The second initiative is the, um, to set up the uh, ASEAN ICT University. Uh, because the, uh, for the fourth the industrial revolution, the most important thing is the schemes for the future, the ICT schemes. And the last one is the uh, ASEAN the uh, Cyber Security Information Sharing Center. I think that the, the, uh, the our life uh, depends uh, very much on the internet. Our prosperity also depends on the internet. But the internet is not safe. So the most important thing for us in the future is the cyber security. And this, the um, initiative, the are open yeah, for this further discussion. And thank you. Minister, thank you very much. Um, moving to our third co-chair, I'd like to invite um, Kang Kyung Hwa, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea, to share your thoughts about the summit ahead. Well, thank you very much, Justin. Very happy to be here with my co uh, distinguished co-chairs. As Foreign Minister of Korea, I'm here because of our policy to upgrade Korea's relations with ASEAN to a whole new level in terms of co-prosperity and peace, and all based upon our joint commitment to the people, uh, that the collaboration going forward will have to benefit the people in the end who are ultimate judges of all that we do. I'm also here because of this focus on the fourth industrial revolution. As you may know, Korea has a, one of the most wired countries in the world, has a bit of a lead experience in dealing with the challenges of the dig digital transformation that the fourth industrial revolution has triggered. So to explore ideas as we go forward towards co-prosperity and creating and sustaining the uh, growth momentum in this age of the fourth industrial revolution will be something that I will be looking into uh, in discussions and, and uh, in, in the forum uh, sessions. But of course, we cannot have prosperity and sustained growth without peace. And as you know, peace in East Asia has had to deal with a vexing problem over the, four, uh, over the past seven decades because of this uh, situation on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the situation on the Korean Peninsula is one of a frozen conflict. Uh, the 1953 armistice has continued to define the relations between South and North Korea uh, for the past seven decades. Um, the armistice had stopped the guns, but has yet to be replaced, replaced by a full peace treaty that will then define the legal relations between South and North Korea. Furthermore, on top of that, over the past three decades, North Korea's nuclear and missile development has advanced to become a serious, perhaps the gravest, security threat, not just on the Korean Peninsula and the region, but the entire global community. But now, uh, through extensive diplomatic endeavors over the past year under the new government of President Moon Jae-in, we have a very real chance to achieve North Korea's complete denuclearization and to establish lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. As you may know, South and North Korea have had two summits so far this year and also uh, a, a first ever US-North Korea summit, as you must know, here in Singapore in June. And in these summits, the top leadership of the three sides have agreed to work towards complete denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula, and also to work towards to start a peace process uh, with the goal of achieving a peace treaty and a peace regime that will replace the current armistice regime. 
And the importance of these agreements that, is that they come at the top leadership level, not like the previous agreements on the nuclear issue that was worked through the working levels and, 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 and ministerial levels. So we do have a, a, a historic opportunity to realize lasting peace and complete denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. At this point, we are preparing for another summit meeting between the South and North Korean leaders in Pyongyang next week. And certainly that will be another significant step forward uh, towards our, our goal. Along this journey, ASEAN and its member states have been, uh, have been hugely supportive. And their continued support will be instrumental going forward. We must maintain the unity of the message to North Korea. And that message is that they need to deliver on their denuclearization commitment. And they need to continue to work with South Korea in good faith to establish lasting peace uh, on the Korean Peninsula. And if it does, uh, it will be brought in to this community of peace and co-prosperity that links Southeast Asia and, and Northeast Asia. So that will be the key messages that I will want to share throughout these past, throughout the next two days. And lastly, I would just like to thank WEF and the government of Vietnam for bringing us together to explore the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution and how our countries and societies may take charge of this digital transformation that the, uh, that the fourth revol industrial revolution has, has triggered in ways that benefit our peoples. So thank you. And if you look at the program, you'll see that there are a number of sessions focused on trying to understand the evolving geopolitical context in the region. Uh, and the minister will be sharing her, her views further in, in some of those sessions. Um, the fourth co-chair I'd like to uh, introduce is uh, Nazir Razak, who is the chairman of CIMB Group, um, a large financial services uh, business based in Malaysia. Nazir. Thank you, Justin. Um, I would like to see WEF 2018 make a big difference uh, in influencing the direction of ASEAN. Uh, in particular, um, as I wrote in the Straits Times uh, last week, we need to place um, the fourth industrial revolution uh, as well as its subsets, uh, digital and entrepreneurship, at the forefront of the ASEAN agenda. Today, the ASEAN Economic Community Blueprint of 2025 uh, is essentially about meeting the original target set in 2007. The world, the economic world, was a very different place um, uh, in 2007. The challenges today are very, very different. Uh, I therefore feel that uh, this is a great opportunity to fully uh, understand the challenges, uh, the disruption uh, that's coming with the fourth industrial revolution and relook uh, at ASEAN's plans uh, for economic integration. Uh, in particular, I think the 4.0 uh, challenge means that we have to place uh, data movement, we have to place talent movement, and we have to place um, um, uh, data human capital uh, as well as um, uh, economic capital, um, how they move across countries uh, to be efficient uh, and frictionless uh, as possible. Uh, that is the key, uh, I think, uh, for uh, the future, uh, and I'm urging uh, that ASEAN relooks at its current plans. Uh, finally, I'd also like us to discuss uh, the side effects uh, of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, the risks of uh, increasing inequality, uh, and of course, uh, in particular, gender inequality, as Anne uh, touched on earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Nazir. Um, our fifth co-chair uh, I'm going to call on is Kevin Sneeder uh, at the end. He is the global managing partner of McKinsey & Company, a uh, management consulting group. <coughs> Kevin. Thanks, Justin. Industrial revolutions so far have brought both opportunity and challenge. And so what I'm hoping that we'll see over the next few days is a discussion around three, I believe, critical factors that ASEAN should and can address. The first is digital productivity. That's at the heart of this fourth industrial revolution. And there are two elements where I think in particular ASEAN has work to do. One is access, access to bandwidth for consumers and businesses alike. It's the foundation of the digital productivity that is going to determine the winners and losers in this fourth industrial revolution. 
And the second part of it is indeed also scale. This is an industrial revolution that does actually leverage scale. If you look at the size of the businesses that are successful and the resources on which they draw, it's therefore ever more important for ASEAN to leverage its scale from across the nations that make up this community. The second thing which I think will be critical is a reinvented labour force. And that, I believe, has several elements. In the Industrial Revolution will bring with it automation, new ways of doing old jobs. Those old jobs aren't necessarily going to disappear, but they are going to be fundamentally changed. In fact, we believe that half of all the world's jobs will be changed. They'll be automated or improved in some way. And it's critical that ASEAN has a labour force that is able to adjust to that automation. The second element of a reinvented labour force is it's no longer going to be possible to get by with large numbers of people excluded from that workforce. We can talk about digital, we can talk about technology. The biggest single lever to drive performance in ASEAN will be to get women into the workforce at scale. So inclusion, I believe, is a huge part of the agenda of the fourth industrial revolution. And the third element of that agenda, beyond digital and the labour force, is infrastructure itself. Only Latin America invests less than ASEAN in terms of infrastructure. ASEAN invests about 3.5% of GDP. That is a half the level of higher income countries across the globe and a third of the level of, for example, China. So there is a real call to action to ensure that you are investing in the infrastructure that will make for success. One last thought. We're actually talking about some of the most successful countries in the world, and sometimes we forget that. But if you look at 71 emerging markets and how they've performed over 50 years, eight of the most successful out of the 18 that have outperformed the United States, eight are to be found in ASEAN. So eight of the 10 ASEAN members have actually displayed very creditable economic performance. There's real belief that that performance gives a foundation for future success, but it does require moving on the digital productivity, the labour force and the infrastructure needed to underpin it. Kevin, thank you very much. And then the final co-chair to call upon is uh, Sri Mulyani Indrawati, who is the finance minister of Indonesia. Thank you, Justin. Um, my priority in attending and co-chairing this World Economic Forum with the theme of ASEAN 4.0, entrepreneurship and the fourth industrial revolution is really the core of many issues that we in ASEAN is also discussing. Indonesia is the largest economy in ASEAN with a population of ASEAN more than 630 million, 400 million labor force. And for Indonesia, 250 million population with more than 100 million workforce, mostly young generation. Kevin mentioned about the youth is actually seeing the technology 4.0, industrial 4.0 is an exciting future. They see it as an opportunity. But of course, as a policymaker, we also understand in order for this industrial revolution and transformation to become an opportunity, equal opportunity for men, women, girls, boys, this need and require policy today that will prepare them to be able to not only using it, enjoying it, but they can adapt, innovate, create. And ASEAN in this case, is actually a group of country that can show that the case of innovation and creativity is there. There are 10 unicorn company, mainly owned by very young generation of ASEAN. Indonesia have Gojek, Tokopi, uh, uh, Traveloka, and many others, which is, I think is really creating an excitement among young generation that technology and industrial transformation is an opportunity. So what we need to do and to discuss within ASEAN, so far the platform of integration through ASEAN economic community, trade, investment, as well as financial integration is already on their way. A lot of things still need to be done for this integration to create an equal opportunity. Kevin mentioned about each country need to address issue of education. And in Indonesia, this is really a big issue because we spend 20% of our budget for education, just like Vietnam here. But the results are different. And this will create an opportunity for a country in ASEAN to learn each other how we can design education. It's not only about money, but what is the content. The second one is about labor force and labor policy. 
I think this is one of the most important on how the young generation is going to have an equal opportunity, flexible labor market that allow them to actually reap the benefit of this technology and take uh, the advantage of being young to actually explore. The third, which I as a finance minister discuss quite a lot about this industrial 4.0 is related to the public finance. How we are going to create a labor force which is flexible if you don't have social safety net. So the design of designing social safety net, allowing population to have the confidence and safety net so that they are allowed to be flexible moving in and out in many of profession will really require and many ASEAN country is still in the very early of designing the social safety net and in order for us to build those sound and strong social safety net you need revenue so taxation on the digital economy industrial 4.0 has been discussed quite widely in a G20 and in IMF World Bank annual meeting and now here in a World Economic Forum in ASEAN. This is one of the issues that we are going to discuss uh, then I hope that with World Economic Forum we will be able to actually come with this awareness and understanding about what will it take for a country to get the benefit of this transformation, what kind of policy platform that need to be addressed and for ASEAN together as a group how we actually can reinforce the integration to create equal benefit for all the member country. I think this is a very timely, especially during the global economic uncertainty today in which protectionism as well as inward looking policy is becoming dominant. ASEAN can become an example of how together we can actually move faster and stronger. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ibu Shri, and all co-chairs. I think six very interesting perspectives, six sets of critical issues for ASEAN to work on for future prosperity, but also, I think, mixed with a strong sense of optimism that, that ASEAN can address these, and hopefully this summit can make a contribution. I'm going to open it up to uh, the floor. Please uh, keep your questions focused on the role that the co-chairs will be playing in the program. Uh, yes, in the front here. Hi, good morning. My name is Kamaru from Maestro Awani in Malaysia. Um, I have an assertion because I've been following Davos and also WF ASEAN. Especially early in January this year in Davos, the book co-authored between Professor Schwab and Nicholas shows that uh, if we do not believe in the power of saying it, then it wouldn't be believed. And if, if it don't be believed, it wouldn't turn into policy and change. However, in ASEAN especially, we look upon that integration more often than not refers to the bureaucracy and the political power. But as we can see, even low-cost carriers like AirAsia has flown and contributed more to integration, arguably, than the ASEAN Secretariat based in Jakarta. So my point, especially to Ibu Sri and also Dr. Sri Nazir Razak, is why are we still looking pretty much at empowering government and also political forces rather than looking at civil society and other non-state actors to integrate it, especially the integration or partnership between civil society and also the business or commercial sector. Thank you. Because otherwise, we look at what happened in Malaysia, the GST I think, I think tax has we, got we, to revamp. Yes, thank uh, you. Thank you for the question. Let's, uh, um, uh, uh, Sri Mulyani, I don't know if you have any views on... Uh, on well, I think if I frame it, it's not empowering bureaucracy to push forward the integration of ASEAN. The fact of the matter that ASEAN is, each of them is a sovereign state. And, and that's why by integrating and forcing the bureaucracy to work together across their own boundary, is actually try to educate them to accept that actually when we have an integration, the benefit actually is much larger than you are actually defining on your own. If you're not addressing the issue of political party and bureaucracy, they can become a real obstacles because they have the constitution, they have the law that can create life really difficult. I've, I've been in this uh, position twice, so I really understand that for them to be forced in the discipline of integrating, interacting with other countries' bureaucracy, then interact with the private sector, especially with the civil society and private sector, their world is going to be opening they can always discuss among themselves. We discuss about liberalization on a financial sector. The discussion is always 
what should I protect in my economy first, rather than saying what is the opportunity of being together as 10. But with the meeting, series of meetings, discussing again and again and interacting with the private sector, NGO, and even meeting with the younger generation, I think they can have a vision as well as a framework of policy that can be opening up. And that really can be accelerated. So the discussion about tax policy in each country, you talk about income tax differences, value added tax, or in this case, GST. We are going to discuss about if people are freely move, uh, free move across the country and also merchandise, goods and services also move freely. They create a certain discipline for a certain country or a country bureaucracy to say that, hey, if your policy is totally outlier, you are not going to get the benefit of this integration. And that's, in my experience in Indonesia, give a sense of a certain direction and discipline of not adopting bad policy and try to maintain a good policy. I think that's very important. I hope that that's uh, addressing your issue. Is there anything to add on the integration process? Part of one of our proposals is to see the transformation of the ASEAN Secretariat into more of a platform uh, organization. Uh, and uh, integral to that is how uh, the private sector can collaborate and really be more involved uh, in uh, originating ideas uh, and also designing policies for uh, regional integration. Um, other questions? Um, we can ha we'll have one here at the front and then we'll move to the back. Chris with uh, German newspaper Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Razak. As we talk about, well, in the end of the day, economic growth in ASEAN, um, what is your perspective on the recent political changes in your country? Will they help and boost economic growth? Thank you. I, I think, w I will w uh, very interesting question, but I think we'll, we'll limit the questions during this press conference just to the roles um, happening during the, the program, so maybe um, uh, afterwards you can, you can uh, discuss that question further. Uh, question at the back. My name is Vũ Hân from Thanh Niên newspaper, youth newspaper. Uh, my question to uh, Mr. Nguyễn Mạnh Hùng. Uh, previously, Vietnam uh, didn't have opportunity to participate in the Industrial Revolution, but in this 4.0 Industrial Revolution, Vietnam have opportunity to take part from the beginning. So whether with a, a country, for a country with low level of technology development uh, in Vietnam, so whether we, or not we can catch up with other countries to gain the benefit of the 4.0 Industrial Revolution. Thank you. When the new revolution coming or happens, the future doesn't depend much on the past. It's something like a, a breaking point. The future is not the continuous of the past. So it means that developing countries having not too much the facility of the previous revolution means that having less burden so they can move faster. The new, the fourth industrial revolution is not too much technology revolution. It's more policy revolution. The developing country having not so robust not so solid, the legal framework could be more flexy to take the new the business model, the new policy to adapt, to accept the new technology. So I think that the um, 
the uh, developing country have more chance. Thank you. Um, we have time for, for one more question. We'll go for the, uh, the, the hand at the back there. Uh, hi, this is for Minister um, Indrawati. Uh, this forum is happening at a time of um, turmoil in emerging economies, and Indonesia in particular is feeling the pinch. Um, what do you think ASEAN countries can do to protect their domestic markets and what is Indonesia in particular doing to support uh, the markets? Thank you. Well, the global economic environment changing very rapidly in 2018. That can be seen from the increasing interest rate by Federal Reserve, normalization, monetary policy in advanced country that really create the cost of borrowing is becoming increased for many countries. So, um, we also see at the same time the policy on the trade and the fiscal policy in the United States create a sentiment. And for many developing countries and emerging countries, they really need to prepare for this changing environment. How they need to change? Of course, first, whether they have an external vulnerability, whether this is in the form of debt, especially foreign debt, whether this is in the form of their uh, balance of payment, trade or current account deficit, and whether they are able to attract more capital when there is really a sentiment against them. So for each country, they have a difference, and that's why the policy response it should be also different. But most importantly, the same theme. You really need to protect yourself from the external vulnerability because this is the source of the dynamic or the challenge for your economy. For Indonesia, we are actually having a current account a deficit up to 3% of GDP. In a normal situation, when the environment globally is actually normal, meaning that the liquidity as well as capital flow is normal, this can be easily financed, just like happened in 2016 and 17. In the 2018, the dynamics is different, and that's why we need to change the policy quite rapidly. First, to protect and reduce the deficit, whether this is in the current account, as well as in our own budget deficit. Fiscal consolidation has been adopted in the three, past three years, and I think on the fiscal side, we are, we are good. We need to build even more industry that can actually uh, produce those uh, products which is imported. And that will take time. And that's why adjustment can be short term. It can also be in the long run. In the short term, you just try to protect of the shock. In the long run, you have to build your competitiveness. Again, I think this theme on ASEAN 4.0, I think again and again is showing that Indonesia can actually become a, a good member of ASEAN, driving the integration, because it, it can protect the member country even more when you are integrated. If you are on your own, you only, in Indonesia case, may be big enough, 250 million population with the young, and mid, uh, young generation and middle class growing. But for other ASEAN countries, may be much smaller. And being integrated, meaning that you have 630 million population with a strong middle class, this can create a cushion from external shock. So I think the message also in this case in addition to your own domestic policy and protecting your economy facing this kind of shock, you have to do even integrating even more within the ASEAN. It's don't follow the instinct which is sometimes even damaging that you try to close and becoming very inward. It's actually crippling even more because you are not going to be uh, getting the ability to uh, withstand uh, any shock. And managing any economy, you cannot always see the economy is moving smooth, uh, linear, uh, upward movement. It's not. Economy globally is always have a challenge. Sometimes shock because of commodity, because of war, geopolitical tension, because of natural disaster. So you have to be really ready and prepared for all those kind of shock while paying attention to what matters for your population or for your uh, people. Younger generation deserve good uh, education. Girls, the women need to be actually have uh, equal opportunity. Uh, 
you have to have a sound macroeconomic policy, you have to be transparent, accountable, to be credible. That is really matters, especially when you are facing with a shock. Um, thank you very much, uh, Minister. So I'm going to draw the press conference to a close because we have run over time. But thank you very much for, for joining us this morning and for your questions. Uh, and I'm sure that at various moments during the rest of the summit, um, you'll have opportunities to connect to the co-chairs to explore ideas in further depth. Thank you.